500 years ago, couldn't have imagined the topic that we're going to discuss this afternoon. And I think a good point of departure is to give some flavor for the people who participate in these markets. This is a panel discussion, not very different from this one. The moderator on the right is a reporter for the New York Times, and he makes the observation that 10% of all Bitcoins ever issued up to that point are in the hands of criminals who have stolen them. And you have Susan Athey, the Stanford professor, um, a colleague, and then on the left is a Bitcoin evangelist, a man named Andreas Antonopoulos. And he says that this is a vast improvement over the rest of the economy, <laughs> where 80% is in the hands of criminals who are the banks. And you're dealing here with a technology that is designed to be very much beyond the reach of traditional regulation. Um, FinTech, and in particular blockchain-based currency, is extremely hard not only to understand but to regulate that even if you can convene a court or a parliamentary commission, the technology is such that you can't really put a lien on it or issue court orders or directives and expect the people to do what you say. That the technology is so decentralized that these markets are completely autonomous. What I'm going to show you are three recent events that have happened really over the course of the past year. Try to draw some lessons from them each, but the overall point is that we're moving into very challenging areas where the way that we've thought about risk management and the tools that we've had to combat problems in risk management aren't going to work well in the future, and I think this is going to be very challenging. Fintech solves a number of problems, and that's the good part of it. In fact, in the end, this may lead us to a system that is more stable and less costly than the one that we already have. But the, at the same time, there are many new problems emerging that we have no idea what to do about. So we'll start here with a very simple case. This was more or less a bank robbery that took place last August. So Bitfinex, thank you, Bitfinex is one of the larger exchanges that is a platform for the trading and custody of Bitcoins and other digital currencies. And there was an event where essentially somebody stole passwords, broke into the exchange, and took 36% of the currency all in the space of a few minutes last August. So this is not terribly different than somebody breaking into a bank vault and making off with the currency, except it's all digital. It's all in the virtual world. And the question was what to do about this. Now, bitcoins are different than regular money because each bitcoin is unique. That if you have a unit of currency, you can authenticate it by essentially tracing it back to the origin so that your bitcoin is not the same as my bitcoin. And if 36% are stolen from this exchange, the question of the depositors are, did they get mine? And for 64%, the answer will be no, they got somebody else's, so, you know, oh, too bad. Now, what the exchange decided to do, though, was to mutualize the loss. In other words, they debited everyone's account by 36%. And this is maybe something that was fair in the sense that it's what people might have voted for ex ante if they had known that this would happen. But ex post, it's something that clearly the majority would be upset, that if they'd held a vote, it would have gone 64 to 36 against. And so the majority of the depositors are really pretty angry, and the question is, what's the remedy? What can you do about this? For instance, can you sue the exchange and try to get a court order? to reverse the transactions. And the short answer to this is really no, that there's not anything that you can do to complain about this, even if you could get a court to hear this, and it's not clear what court has jurisdiction, no remedy could really be enforced because there's nowhere to take a court order. Um, we've had these problems in drug cases where people bought drugs with Bitcoin, and then the Bitcoin are supposed to be forfeited. But if you go to the drug dealer and say, give me my Bitcoin, these belong to the police now, there's no way for them to actually make this happen without the consent of the person involved. There's, in other words, there's nobody in charge of this system who has the authority to overwrite a transaction, to reverse an error, to fix a problem that goes wrong. 
So you have here very simply an autonomous currency that exists really according to the will of the people who exchange it, but once it's transferred, any transfer is irrevocable and no court, no regulator can attach it. So you're in a very interesting area where dispute resolution doesn't really exist. When we talk about interventions by government and bailouts of banks and all kinds of things that go wrong in the risk area, ultimately some regulator, some legal authority is going to step in and reverse transactions and put, put things back as they were. Um, here it was done by the sponsor of the exchange, but they did it completely unilaterally and ultimately it's only their reputation as opposed to any legal rule that's going to hold them to account. This puts you back in many ways into the 19th century, into the era of free banking, where banks pretty much made and followed their own policies for risk management. They lived and died based on their reputations, and the burden was really on the customer to do the due diligence about the safety of any institution, about where to deposit your money. You're now in that position with some of these fintech exchanges and platforms that the burden is on you as a depositor to figure out for yourself, maybe by reading the code, to think about is this a good place for me to put my money. As long as these things stay small, this is a curiosity. It's not necessarily a threat to the system, but there's no question that the growth rate of these is very, very fast. We're talking about central banks getting into the area of digital currency. And I think some of these basic questions about what courts have competence to intervene in disputes and how that intervention could even take place are going to be very big problems in the future. Let me move on to my second example. This one's very recent. Um, it took place just about three weeks ago. Uh, many of you may have heard, and I hope nobody was directly involved, but there was a computer virus that spread around the world and ultimately about 200,000 computers were locked down by something called ransomware. And what they do is basically open a back door to your computer. In this case, these were people who were running Windows XP and had not done the security updates and so forth. But they lock your computer and they demand ransom and the ransom is paid in Bitcoin. In fact, Bitcoin only. They don't take any other payment. So to get your computer back online, you had to send $300 worth of Bitcoin to a certain address. Now, many, many people were caught up in this, and the risk here is really operational, you know, the ability to keep your organization online. So among other people who were crashed, the British National Health Service essentially closed for a couple days while they tried to get their computers back online. Um, interestingly, the Russian Ministry of the Interior, of all people, were targeted by this, and some major U.S. companies such as Federal Express and Walmart were also victims. So this falls into the category of cyber risk, where basically you're so vulnerable to information technology that the entire day-to-day -day operation of the organization can fall victim very suddenly to a virus and a lot of people blame Bitcoin for this because the, um, the ransom is payable only in Bitcoin as opposed to dollars or euros or another currency. Now, it turns out that this is going to be the undoing of the hacker, that because Bitcoin is on a blockchain, it's extremely transparent that whenever somebody pays the ransom, you can actually see the payment, where it goes, and which digital wallet receives it. So, what they were able to do was essentially look at how many people paid $300 to a small set of addresses that were posted on this ransomware, and it turned out that the answer was 1,700 people. So out of 200,000 that were hacked, somewhere less than 1% actually paid the ransom, and whoever the hackers were now have a problem of how to get their Bitcoin out of those digital wallets, um, this is one of the problems that is nicely solved by digital currency because you can actually trace money laundering, drug dealing, um, tax evasion, anything that people shouldn't be doing and can be easily done with cash can actually be watched transaction by transaction on the blockchain. This is a great tool for surveillance and for investigators. Um, 
there's a lot of speculation about who was behind this, and immediately people thought North Korea. Um, I think Washington, in many ways, is a more logical suspect, and the question is, who were they targeting? Was it, in fact, the Russian Interior Ministry, or was it, was it the British Health Service? I mean, it's, it's hard to know. Um, in time, we'll probably know more about this, but I think this operational risk is very, very interesting, that if you read about this, the ransomware market turns out to be about a billion dollars a year. This is not something new, but this one attack was on a much greater scale than we've seen before. But cybercrime, broadly defined, turns out to be a $3 trillion industry, which is absolutely massive. And I think as academics, we are only beginning to get our minds around this and to figure out how to, how to measure it, how to benchmark it as a risk factor, how to price it into the value of corporate securities. Um, my colleague Inga Walter asked me to come teach about cyber risk in a program on risk management we have. And what I discovered was that absolutely nobody has written about this from a financial point of view. And when I came across this total, it's actually three trillion, and then you think about the size of the worldwide capital markets, it's a big number. People should be really specializing in this, thinking about the right benchmarks, and thinking about really how to identify the companies that handle this well versus those that don't. In the case of um, this ransomware, it turns out that there's a whole industry of subcontractors that if you want somebody to send bitcoins for you for ransom, there are call centers set up in Pakistan and Bangladesh and places like this where people are employed to actually take phone calls as a help desk and show you how to make the Bitcoin transfer to coach you through the steps. I mean, it's amazing that this flourishes unpunished and unregulated out there in the Netherlands. But there's a very elaborate industry that's out there. And to me, the risks to financial stability probably aren't going to come from risky mortgages the next time the banking system come, goes down. I think a much more likely source is some virus like this that spreads uncontrollably, where you know here these people were willing to let you off the hook for $300, but you could imagine a more sinister, more costly attack that really doesn't give you the opportunity to get back online. One last point, and then I'll move on to my third case. The reporting on this event by the news media was incredibly unintelligent. Um, you could read in the New York Times that the hackers here could have earned as much as a billion dollars from this. Now, we can all do the math. Let's say there's 200,000 computers infected and every single one pays $300 ransom. Last I looked, this is $60 million, and this should have leaped into the head of the editors of the New York Times. You know, this is not a billion dollars any way you build it up from the bottom. And I think people are willing to repeat cliches and just take half-truths and print them in, you know, essentially create fake news in a financial world. And we need to learn much more about this cybercrime. And I think that this is you know, a new area that for academics is potentially a very fruitful research channel, but for people who do this for a living should be you know, really a matter of great concern. Let's talk now about a totally different topic, the so-called smart contract. And where I want to go with this is talk about the attack that took place about a year ago on something called the DAO, but let me work up to this. A smart contract is essentially a contract that executes itself mechanically. And the original smart contract actually goes back well into the 19th century, the vending machine. You know, today the modern equivalent is the Coke machine. If you put in your two euros, it mechanically delivers the beverage to you without any thought about defaulting on its obligation. And you know, this is very different than the debt markets where if you lend money, they'll think about, well, what's the cost of them taking me to court and so forth. So a smart contract is essentially where you use technology, and in today's world, it's typically information technology, to execute somebody's promise in lines of code if certain contingencies are met. So a very simple example that is often used to introduce the topic is a car loan. If you buy a new automobile, you may agree to 48 monthly payments. 
and they may be due by midnight on the first of every month. And if it so happens that on the first of July you haven't made the payment by midnight, they just remotely shut off the ignition to your car. And then the car can probably drive itself back to headquarters. And so you don't need the repo man, you don't need the lawyer to go to court to get the lien on the car. The, in other words, the cost of enforcement drops pretty much to zero. Now the point is not so much to repossess the car as for the borrower to know that with certainty there will be consequences if they default. And so the people will not do the calculation of I can probably miss two payments before, you know, and, so, and the repo man will never find my car. They, they will simply not engage in this behavior, and this is really a technology for screening, where you eliminate the lemons from the market and get only creditworthy borrowers. This, in principle, should drive down the cost of debt, make cars cheaper, expand maybe the market for buyers, that everybody's better off under such a system except the people who would have defaulted anyway. So this all sounds well and good until these contracts stop working the way they should. And the joke is, in fact, that smart contracts, as at least as implemented today, are neither smart nor contracts in the sense that you can't get legal restitution from courts if things go wrong. So let's talk about the DAO. DAO stands for a Decentralized Autonomous Organization. This is a company run by robots with no employees, that you just write code and the organization goes about its business, but there's no way for humans to intervene or stop it or shut it down if it begins to do things that people wish it weren't. So these are the companies and universities of the future, where it's just computers running things with no people. And it is a world where unintended consequences may carry the day. So in this case, this organization was hosted on the Ethereum platform. And you may recognize Ethereum is essentially the strong number two digital currency these days. It's, um, in fact, it may overtake Bitcoin even within the next few weeks and become the top of the pyramid. But it's a platform for executing these smart contracts using a currency called Ether that re resides on the Ethereum blockchain. And what happened with the DAO was somebody decided to start a venture capitalist, a robot venture capitalist that would invest money of people and would do it according to some mechanical algorithm that everybody could read about. Now, you may think that this sounds like a stupid thing to invest in, but this thing raised very quickly $150 million when they launched it last April. People thought, wow, this is the next new thing. I'm going to buy a bunch of ether and send it to the robots running the DAO. And so there was a lot of excitement about this until the night of June 17th, when a hacker showed up and stole about a third of the ether. And you know, there was a lot of irony to this, partly because a Cornell computer science professor had given a lecture saying, don't invest in the DAO because there are bugs in the code, that there's obviously, you know, there's ways for people to steal the money, and then we'd, we don't know if someone was in the audience or whether it was the professor, you know. Maybe we'll find out someday, but true enough, somebody actually took the money, and so this was, um, you know, really a debacle that called into question the whole nature of the technology. Now, what happened? This is a system that existed on a blockchain. And for those of you not conversing with blockchains, it's essentially a sequence of records that in this case, they're arranged by number and you block together. In the case of Bitcoin, there's a new block every 10 minutes. The cycle time is faster in Ethereum, but these are essentially transactions marching through time and this block, which happened to end in four nines, was where the hacker arrived and stole all the ether. And then things marched forward with a bunch of angry people. What they decided to do was rewind history and go back to right before the hacker came and do what they called a hard fork, which is start a new blockchain. In other words, imagine that the stock exchange dropped 80% and say, oh, we wish this had never happened. Let's just have a do-over and go back to Monday and, you know, and just erase Tuesday and you know, we'll, we'll do a hard fork. So this is what happened here. 
And it was interesting in several respects. One is that a minority of about 15% of the people on the blockchain thought that this was just morally wrong to rerun the tape and rewrite history. And so they refused to go back down this path and continued. What happened, in other words, was a schism. And so for almost a year now, there have been two versions of Ethereum, one that calls itself Ethereum and one that calls itself Ethereum Classic. This was not designed into the system that you could have rival versions of the same currency. And so if you had bought this anywhere back here, you now own two different Ethereums that can be spent in two different worlds. It's like having two popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon. And you could go to both churches, but chances are you're going to go to one or the other. But the real issue here, and this has really raised a lot of questions about the technology, is the principle involved in going back and having a redo when people are not happy with the events that took place. Because as I've written on the slide, basically two things have happened that were supposed to be impossible with this technology. The first is that, in fact, you've rewritten the history on the blockchain. And according to what you've probably read elsewhere, blockchains are supposed to be immutable and that once a transaction is written into them, it's there forever. But here they sort of erased several months' worth of transactions because they kind of decided that this wasn't something they wanted to live with. And the second thing is that you had a smart contract that was actually stopped where a, the plug was pulled and the robot had run amok and they decided to just shut the thing down. This also was supposed to be impossible, that smart contracts were supposed to be irrevocable except by mutual consent of all the people involved, and here there was simply an intervention. Now, I've used the word they several times, and you should be wondering at this point, who is the they? Because this is a decentralized system like Bitcoin, where there's really nominally nobody in charge. Now, in this case, there is a charismatic founder who was a Ukrainian gentleman in his early 20s, Vitaly Buterin, <coughs> He essentially organized the vote and was able to get 85% of the investors on the chain to agree that this would be okay. But it's not really, in, he's exercising authority that he does not have. And I suppose he's creating a focal point for protest or resistance, but what he's really doing is demonstrating that mob politics can be a basis for intervening in something like this. That if you can rabble rouse enough people to get angry about the technology, you can probably pull the plug and rewind the tape and people won't be able to do much about it. Because the intervention leads to all kinds of questions. Like if you're in the 15% who don't agree, can you sue these people? Or if you can sue them, in what court? How would a judgment be enforced and so forth? So, a lot of people are left shaking their heads about this. About When people talk about smart contracts, how can we know, first of all, that the contract won't invoke other contracts and create death spirals that suck the business or the bank or whatever into some vortex from which it can't escape? Or if the contract goes too extreme in one direction, is there some opportunity to pull the plug, shut it down? And if so, who actually should I go to to ask about that? Who's in charge, in other words? And getting your head around these things is really a very new problem, but obviously an important one. The, um, the thing that seems to cross many of these three, ex you know, these examples in a similar way is the problem of governance that it's easy enough to create and program these things, but once they're up and running, who's in charge and who can intervene in the cases of disputes and under what criteria should these interventions occur? These are rules that the crypto specialists behind the currencies have thought very little about, but as they become larger and larger capitalization, it seems like an issue of more and more importance to the institutions and to the technology itself. I think we're in a very early stage with this technology. And the one thing that I wouldn't do is assume that this is going to go away. That when you talk to people about fintech, a lot of them shrug their shoulders and say, well, this is a fad, this is going to be gone, you know, this is silly, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, I think this stuff is growing much faster than most people are willing to acknowledge. And younger people especially are very comfortable with mobile payments on their telephones and with depositing virtual money, never holding physical cash in their hands. And there are more and more creative products, many of them very good and useful, that solve problems that have been in the financial system for years. But at the same time, they are bringing with them totally new issues that risk destabilizing the financial system if these things grow big enough. And I think that as people schooled in game theory, risk management, microeconomics, and so forth, Finance specialists have a lot to add to this area, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity to do that as you see more and more scandals and, and accidents of the type that I've shown in these three examples. Above all, regulators have to really think about this, that in the U.S. there's been a little game going on where the SEC, the securities regulator, has said that digital currency is really a security. And the CFTC has said, no, it's a commodity. We should get to regulate it. And the bank regulators have said, no, it's money. It's something, you know, in other words, there's a turf war. But the real answer to this dispute is that these assets are not any of the securities that we already know. They really are not like equities or bonds or currencies. They're new and they're very different. And I think regulators have to meet them on their own terms and this begins with government learning about them, learning about the costs and benefits and strengths and weaknesses. And I think that process has barely begun. There's huge opportunity but huge risk here. And I think that a lot of the interesting stuff in finance over the next, say, 20 to 50 years will be figuring out how to accommodate this stuff as it phases its way into the financial system and displaces more and more of the legacy transactions that will no longer be as attractive to people because of their high cost and their own types of risk. So let me stop at that point and we'll take some questions. So are you Thank going you to call? Thank you very much. This was a very exciting talk. So can we start from the left? Francesca, can you please bring the microphone up here? Thank you. Absolutely fascinating talk. Um, Alex Murray from University College London. Uh, I hope you can understand that in the past year it's been quite a stressful time for a person living in London. And I'm hoping you can give me some hope for the future. So my question is mainly, it's, it's centered around the idea that we don't have many cards left up our sleeve for the impending negotiation. But one thing that maybe London does have is it is an area where fintech has really started to take off and there's Right. There's, there's evidence of sort of agglomeration and, and the benefits of, of young, intelligent people working together. Um, I suppose my question is, <clears throat> is there a geography for the production of fintech? Arguably, there's never been a type of technology that's so footloose that can be done anywhere. But is there, is there something about a metropolis like London or New York or Amsterdam that allows the production of fintech to really take off? Yeah, this is an interesting question, and it makes me think of stuff that Michael Porter wrote a long time ago about communities of people. He, he pointed out that all shoes are made in Italy because you get people sharing technology, talking to each other. And there are clearly some fintech hubs, and you can identify five or six of them really around the world. New York and London being two, Singapore, Shanghai are two others. And people have talked about Rotterdam and Berlin is, you know, I think they're maybe a little bit behind. But yeah, at the moment, the interest in this is not uniform. And I think Shanghai in particular is where most people would point to as having overtaken other places. And I think partly it's because the Chinese have so little faith in their own banking system that they're willing to try this. You know, that in London and New York, it works reasonably well, but everyone knows that China is going down any day now, so they're looking for alternatives. But I think that in the long run, this technology is universal. It crosses borders. That's why these people want ransom in Bitcoin, because you don't have to do any foreign exchange conversion. And it's going to greatly undermine the ability of central banks to conduct stabilization policy and so forth. 
You can also collaborate virtually with people online. So I'm not sure that being physically in the same place is going to be as important with this technology as it is with like being a leather craftsman and making shoes. Um, you know, I agree with your observation about London. I've been to many fintech conferences in London just in the last year or two because that's where the action is. But whether it's a sustainable advantage, I, I think the nature of the technology is such that it's relatively easy for it to escape and diffuse around the world. But I would ride the horse for as long as you can. I, I'd be much more interested in these markets than you know, the markets that may go to Frankfurt or Paris. Those are you know, the legacy markets of yesterday. Great. Uh, Rachel Zamba, actually, uh, I want to piggyback off his question, the comments you just make on, made on clustering. Yeah. Um, I've been to a few recent fintech conferences, one in Germany where there was one of these nice slides with all of these fintech, mostly money transfer options. Yeah. Um, and then another one where it was looking at financial services entities that had one way or the other invested in or thought about maybe we should be thinking about blockchain technology not necessarily involving cryptocurrencies and the like i was just your fantastic presentation focused a lot on uh, some of the legal institutional and other issues relating to cryptocurrencies are there any broad trends that you're seeing relating to use of uh, blockchain and the trust bases elsewhere in the financial sector, areas of future research? You know, Thanks. The, the killer app for this is supply chain management. Um, this is growing extremely quickly in logistics and shipping and trade credit, trying to integrate the whole process for somebody who is maybe in the mining business and is going to dig up, ship, refine iron ore and deliver it ultimately to a, to a construction site in another country. Walmart, IBM, Microsoft are making big investments in this. Um, there's no digital currency involved whatsoever, but there is the blockchain technology that is meant to replace the trust in a third party with cryptography, because in supply chain management, people backdate and they forge records and they lie and you know, they hold on to collateral longer than they really should. And if you could rationalize that system and enforce it with smart contracts, the possibilities for savings are vast. And IBM has woken up to this. They have a project with Maersk at the port of Rotterdam, you know, where all the containers coming in and out for Europe are now being tracked on a blockchain. This is why I say this isn't going away because Big institutions are realizing that this is probably as significant as the advent of double entry bookkeeping 600 years ago in terms of the, the leap forward in, in, in the integrity and the accuracy of the information. And the big players in not just finance, but in many industries are rapidly finding ways to use this. Healthcare would be another, um, but there are many, identity, um, border security. Um, Look at what the Emirates are doing with blockchain technology. It's very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, the Bitfinex. Yeah. I don't think there's a charter for a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, well, somebody has to own it, right? It's a, if it's incorporated as a... I'm not sure it's even incorporated. I mean, you're making a lot of assumptions about how we regulate things in yeah. the old financial system and thinking it's the same. And you could start tonight at your house a Bitcoin exchange, and there's really no regulator now, some people say you should register, and there have been cases in the U.S. where they say you're a money transmitter, so you have to right. register. But there are plenty of jurisdictions where you can go where there are no such oh, laws. Mm -hmm. You just have to be out there in the cloud somewhere, right. and that's sort of the nature of the problem. And then the related question is, um, if the WannaCry um, exploit essentially failed because there was really no way for them to take the Bitcoin they received yeah. and do anything with it, why isn't that true in the Bitfinex scandal? So they stole 36%. Why can't those be traced and say, oh, well, you're the thief? No, they can. And I think, you know, that's what's characteristic of all this technology, that 
I got interested in this back in 2013 when the U.S. Senate held hearings on Bitcoin and Bernanke gave testimony saying that this is interesting technology and it has a role to play. And I thought, why would the chairman of the Federal Reserve want Bitcoin to have a role in the financial system? And then what clicked in my mind was exactly this issue, that you can trace everything and you get a universal ledger of every transaction by every person. You just have to match it with digital wallets. Now, there is a whole industry of people who try to sell anonymity. There are things like Bitcoin tumblers, where you take the Bitcoins of like 200 people and shake them up and redistribute them, and they're supposed to become much harder to trace. It's called washing the Bitcoins, because literally it's money laundering. Some people will change their digital wallet address with every transaction. And there are cryptocurrencies where the blockchains are supposed to be invisible. So if I was the WannaCry person, I would be flipping my Bitcoins into Zcash or maybe into Monero and then back into Ether. You know, that I would try to go through steps that I thought people couldn't trace. And you're really talking about an arms race between the industry on the other side, which tries to chase these people and smoke them out. And in this case, it was done with WannaCry at such an elementary level that people say, oh, this must be the North Koreans because they're really so inept. Um, I think it was probably the NSA who was probably not so interested in the ransom as just freezing somebody's computer and we're not quite sure whose. You know, like the Stuxnet worm that escaped, it was really targeted just at the Iranian nuclear program, but it ended up on all the computers in the world. So, you know, the, the answer to your question is there probably are ways to try to get the money that may be somewhat effective, but in the long run, a good programmer and a good, you know, police force with the cyber skills should be able to follow the money in the cloud. And, you know, this is really where the dynamic of regulators and enforcement is going to be in the future, and it's going to be kind of fun. Your kids who are playing video games all the time, they're actually learning very valuable skills. They'll transfer this there. I, I don't know the, f I, I think they were able to launder the money quickly enough that they stayed a step ahead. But I, to be honest, I haven't looked into that particular case. The other thing is that regulators don't often have an incentive to pursue these. Um, you know, you sort of have to do it privately. The great hack was the Mt. Gox exchange in Japan, which, and that's really where most of the 10% of Bitcoins went. And we actually can look today at all the Bitcoins still sitting in the digital wallet, and the question is, who has the private key to unlock those? Everybody thinks it's the guy who was running the exchange, and um, maybe yes, maybe no, but as of now, nobody's tried to move those Bitcoins. They're just kind of frozen in place, and there's no way to unfreeze them without the private key. I would like uh, to ask you, what, what about Bitcoin and uh, monetary policy? And uh, the quantity of money in terms of monetary policy? So I think you're referring to the fact that the rate of Bitcoin issuance gradually decreases through time. Is that, you know, right, right now Bitcoins are issued at a rate of 12 and a half new Bitcoins every 10 minutes, but they cut that in half every four years. And eventually, this will top out at no more Bitcoins after the year 2140. This is very interesting because the people who designed it represented that two things were true. One is that this approximates the historical rate at which precious metals like gold have been dug out of the ground. Now, you can actually look at data about this, and it's completely false. You know, these are libertarian people who have nostalgia for the gold standard who thought they were recreating a digital gold standard and they did it completely backwards, that the rate of gold production has actually been convex and not concave through history. The other thing they believe is that this is how Milton Friedman would have done it, to keep money neutral. And again, we can go back and actually read Milton Friedman and what he would have done was have the rate of money growth equal GDP growth so that you know, people would be indifferent to money. And Satoshi Nakamoto, the mythical creator of Bitcoin, wrote about this. He says, I don't know any way for the software to know the rate of GDP growth, so we're just going to do it this way. Now, I think the way they chose is really pretty stupid, that if you want to have a monetary system, 
you're going to have deflation if you run out of money, but the economy keeps growing. And so if the economy grows 2%, we're all going to have to cut our wages 2% and feel like we got a raise. And that's, you, you have until the year 2140 to kind of reorient your beliefs about behavioral finance. But right now, such a system, I think, would be very destructive to economic growth. And I wouldn't have designed it this way. There are more than 800 digital currencies now, and they all have their own rates of money growth. And many of them look very different from Bitcoin. Um, I think in the long run, though, none of them is likely to become the money of the world such that their rate of money creation is really so important that we worry about it. And in the case of Bitcoin, you can always change it by 51% vote, by some kind of mob hard fork, sort of like what happened with Ethereum. Okay, Steve. Yeah. Uh, as you've uh, explained, it seems like uh, each Bitcoin is unique in the sense of, uh, you made the anal analogy to like the wildcat banking era. Yeah. Do you have the right to refuse uh, to accept a particular Bitcoin? Uh, for example, I mean, if, if it were uh, uh, publicized, what the transactions were, the holders of those coins before they got hacked, yeah. everybody could say, well, I don't take those. Is that possible? I think you couldn't refuse to receive it, but you could freeze it in the sense that if you did receive it, if you have a digital wallet, there's no way to stop people from depositing money into the digital wallet. But if someone puts in a black Bitcoin, you know, one that was involved in, I don't know, human trafficking or conflict diamonds or, you know, terrorist financing, whatever, you could essentially freeze it by burning the private key and never spending it. So you could withdraw it from circulation. Now why someone sent you the Bitcoin, if they actually owed you money, they would view that they had fulfilled their debt. You know, and I don't think you could get them to pay you twice if you didn't want to take the first one. But I think there could be boycotts and ways of isolating bad Bitcoins that are known to have been tied to this. And I think it would be very interesting to see such a movement spring up. You know, this, this WannaCry thing is maybe not the worst thing in the world, but these people are so libertarian and they're against everything that they may actually like the WannaCry virus because it targeted governments and so forth. So um, I'm not sure ultimately you're going to see this be the catalyst, but you can imagine facts being so extreme that it might spur people to, to act on those terms. Yeah. Okay. I think we need to close the session because it's time for the coffee break. We have a uh and a panel coming up. So let me join, please, me in thanking Professor Yermak again for this fascinating. <laughs>